Sam, uh, Machine Gun Preacher, welcome <coughs> to Locked In. Thank you to Demons Row, Sosa Ghost, for making this happen. All the way from uh, Africa yeah. uh, to be here. I'm glad we made this work and we can I'm, sit down with I'm you. I'm telling you. Yeah, really awesome, man. Yeah, and uh, for the audience, he's fired up today. <laughs> he's ready to lock and load. <laughs> yeah. And, and I want you to plug in, you know, your books, your, your movies, your documentaries. Right. You're working on a third book now. Yeah. Um, you have a new documentary that just came out, and I want to plug that in on th at the top of this. Yeah, I tell you what, for I always say for a non-educated hillbilly, uh, uh, God really done a lot in my life. You know, we got the Hollywood movie and stuff, The Machine Gun Preacher. <clears throat> it's still on Netflix. It's still on Amazon, Amazon Prime, Hulu, a lot of places. But there's a documentary it's about 10 years old. And it's still, last year, my preacher found out that there was 123,000 downloads and people still buying it and watching it. That's the old documentary. So I have uh, two books that's out. Another Man's War is one. Living on the Edge is a second one. The third book is titled The Most Unlikely. And when you open the third book, it sounds like it's about me because it has my name, but really it's about you. And when you read the title, the, the front of the book says uh, the, the most unlikely, you open it, the most unlikely never to succeed in life, Sam Childers. But when you read the book, the book is about giving people opportunities. Like if a man wouldn't have given me an opportunity many, many years ago, I wouldn't be here today. I'd probably either be in prison or I'd probably be dead, you know, because the lifestyle I was living many years ago, there was only two things for you in that lifestyle, death or prison. Where were you born? <clears throat> My dad was part American Indian. My dad thought unemployment was welfare. <clears throat> so we moved all over the U.S. I was born in North Dakota he was working on the missile plants. My brothers were born in Minnesota. Uh, we ended up here in Pennsylvania. He, uh, uh, he was building the coal temples, you know. So we, I went to seven different high schools over the U.S., you know. So we traveled around a lot, you know. Wow. What was that like, like hopping around as a young kid? Do you think that affected <clears throat> you know, your growth and development? I don't believe that's good for children to move around like that because— I believe that's what put me in, got me into a lot of situations that I made bad decisions. You know, when you go into a new school, you know, if you're raised from kindergarten all, all the way to 12th grade, one school, you know, you can decide who you want to be. But back in my day, you were either a nerd, a jock, or a hood. You know, there was only three choices. <clears throat> and the ones that always welcomed everyone— was the hoods. And the hoods were the ones, you know, smoking cigarettes, doing drugs and partying, you know. So that's where a lot of my troubles came from. So <clears throat> you went with the hoods, I'm guessing? You know, like I said, it wasn't, I think the hoods are more open, you know. A jock was the ones that always wanted to tease you and make fun of the, of the people that might not be right in school, you know. And so the hoods were the ones that would take up for the nerds. And I, I got to say, the hoods were the ones that welcomed everyone. I mean, if you were a nerd, the hood was going to welcome you, you know, but welcome you with a joint, you know. That is very true. I never looked at it that way. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. If there was one thing from your childhood you could kind of relive or take back or wish didn't happen, what would that be if there is anything? You know, I don't think there's anything that I would want to change. I believe that what I've went through, uh, the fights, you know, uh, everything that I went through in life made me who I am today. So if I would want to change something, it might change who I ended up being. And I don't really want to change yet because my heart now is saving children. I mean, that's my life. And you don't find too many people that dedicated 28 years of their life to being in a war zone rescuing children, you know, and I never used to really look at it until my family, my brother and me is really close. And I used to just think, well, I'm just an ordinary person until one day, not too many years ago and stuff. My brother said, Sam, look who you are. 
Look who you are. Who dedicates 28 years to saving children? Now I'm getting old. You know, I'm 62 years old. Still suiting up, still putting on a bulletproof vest, still going into the wars rescuing children. So if I change something of my past, it might change who I am today, and I don't want that. Yeah, and, and it's so you know uh, interesting and unique that you're not just speaking on the past. You're living this now. Like in two weeks or in a week, you go back out there to continue what you're doing. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I want the world to really see. You know, I'm really pushing the new documentary, Never Stop. I feel there's too many people my age that worked hard all their life for a retirement. And then they stop and they die, you know. So <clears throat> I, I, I believe that the documentary is for young people, but it focuses a lot on old people to realize that life is not over till you take that last breath. Now, how do you want to take that last breath? You want to take it in a lounge chair? You want to take it in a hospital bed? You want to take it in an old folks home? Me? I think it'd be pretty cool. Take that last breath, saving a life. Now, even though um, you guys hopped around a lot during your family growing up, were you guys close knit? Did you guys have like a, a good family? <clears throat> me, and, me and my dad. My dad was a pretty hard ass. You know, my dad was a Marine, born again Christian. So I, I can't take that from him. I mean, born again, solid Christian. But he was a badass. I mean, when I was probably 12 years old, uh, I seen him beat up two guys, you know, grown men, you know. And uh, it wasn't that he started it. They started it with the wrong man, you know. And uh, so so he was a, he was a hard guy. He, like I said, he was a Marine. He was a boxer. <clears throat> he brought me and my two brothers up that if there's a bully in the school, you better bully the bully. He brought us up, never walk away from a fight, but if you start one, he's going to beat us when we get home. And he, he brought us up never to walk away from someone that needs help. And I believe that's why my first book was called Another Man's War. I mean, I was fighting all the time. If you get a close look at my hands, <laughs> my hands are all messed up, arthritis and, and everything. I, I broke all the knuckles in my hands, you know. And it was from fighting over the years because our dad brought us up. You, you, you always help someone that can't help theirself. So the, the title to my first book Another man's war. It was like I was always fighting. To this day, I'm still fighting, and it's somebody else's war, not mine. Why do you think you needed, you know, the trials and tribulations you went through at a young age to get to where you are now? Even with that, you know, the values he was teaching you, it feels like you had the tools you needed to succeed in what you're yeah. doing now, but something stopped you. You know, <clears throat> as a Christian, I am a Christian. I'm not a Bible thumper, okay? <laughs> I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But a lot of times people think that when you give your life to the Lord, you got to change everything. Listen, Ed, I'm not here to preach today, okay? I'm here to get you to buy my documentary. But God don't want to change your whole life. All he wants to do is pull your heart out and give you a new heart. You can still live the same lifestyle. I'm still the same person I was all my life. I'm still a biker. I'm a one percenter living a dream now, okay? But I just got a different heart now. And my heart is that he gave me was to save children. That's my life, you know. Did you ever want to go to college or have a career? What, what was I high was in college, thinking? man. I was selling drugs, but I never went to class. <laughs> no, I, I never finished school. <clears throat> if you read my second book, you know, my second book, everyone says, what's in your second book? Everything that wasn't in my first. <laughs> but my second book, you know, I, I had girls that worked for me when I was 15, 16 years old, you know, prostitutes. Uh, I used to do some of my teachers, you know, and people would say, well, how come that never hit the news? Listen, I was the guy that never wanted to tell because I didn't want to stop it, you know. <laughs> but but I lived a life when I was 13, 14 years old, I'm doing my teachers, you know. And so I, I lived a pretty crazy lifestyle, you know. So I, I, as I said, I wouldn't want to change anything in my life. 
You know, nowadays you can't get away with that without someone telling on you. Well, no, you don't <laughs> tell nobody. Yeah, but that's what they do <laughs> now. Even, even, <laughs> even my buddies back then would would always say, "Hey, you're doing the social studies teacher, aren't you?" And I'd say, "No, man, no. Come on, you know," because I didn't want it to stop. You know, if you squill, you tell the wrong person. You know. Mm. But that stuff's been going on a long time, you know. It's so interesting that it was even going on back then. But getting back to what I was saying, you know, and and I'm not a person that's thumping Jesus Christ down somebody's throat. But without him, I wouldn't be who I am. Okay, he's the one that gave me the calling to saving children. And <clears throat> when I started in Africa, and this is what's good about the documentaries and the books that I've wrote— you know, I was always a businessman, even though I have no education, no high school education. I was always good at business and a hard worker. That's how my dad brought us up, work hard. So when I first went to the mission field, I was in my early 30s. I wasn't, I wasn't some young kid like you going to the mission field, man. I owned a real estate company. I had 17 houses and eight stores that I rented out. Uh, I had a construction company my last year before I said, I'm going to be a missionary. My last year, I filed taxes on 180000 Of gross? Or, yeah. Okay. No, that's what I made. Well, that's what you made profit. No, that's what I made profit, man, 180000 okay. Which is good for that's back then. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's not just good. That's very good for, you know, that many years ago. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> I get this calling to be a missionary. I didn't want to be a missionary. I mean, I lived a lifestyle where I could go into a store, <clears throat> buy what I wanted. I never looked at the price. I could, I could go into a restaurant. I never looked at the price on the menu. I ordered what I wanted to eat, you know. Then all of a sudden, I go to the mission field. I spend all my money, sell all my real estate, Two and a half years later, I'm broke, you know, wondering what am I going to do? I, I got to keep this thing going, you know. I love to tell the story. I started over 18 years ago, one of my first feeding programs. And that feeding program started with 20 kids. And to this day, it's over 10,000 meals every day. That's incredible. I'm telling you. Now, before you um, had a successful real estate business or construction business, you were down a whole entirely different path. It's almost like your life was in stages. Well, yes and no. I, I mean, <clears throat> when, I, when I quit school at 15 years old, I moved out of my home. My, my mom and dad, both born again, spirit-filled Christians, but cool parents, okay? Uh, what I mean by that, my, my, my mom would come over to my house after I moved out. They knew I was selling drugs and everything. She'd bring in a meatloaf and food for everyone. You know, everyone's going to chow down. You know, you got the munchies and stuff. But, I mean, at 15 years old, and you, from the first documentary, you'll see people interviewed that says, yeah, at 15, 16, he's walking around with a suitcase full of drugs, you know. And I did. So I made big money. <clears throat> and so all those years— the enterprise, if you want to call it the enterprise of selling drugs, kept getting bigger, you know. There was a time in my life I just thought, well, I don't need God. I knew God was real, okay? I never doubted God. always knew he was real. It's just when I was younger, like 15 to 22, even 25 years old, I had money. I had drugs. I had guns. I had women, motorcycles. I had everything I thought I needed in life, you know. So even when I was a thug, scum of the earth, whatever you want to call it, I still made money. You're always entrepreneurial. That's a kind of a yeah, key Yeah, kind of a hillbilly, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, businessman, you know. Now, did you ever use the drugs for yourself or Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. I was I was a heroin addict. Uh, and I shouldn't say heroin addict. I was probably more of a cocaine addict. I never, I never snorted. When I was 13, 14 years old, I would snort. But I started shooting up at 15. <clears throat> there was probably two years of my life that I li lived as a bad addict. I mean, you get up in the morning, you're sitting on the toilet, ramming a needle, you know, uh, throughout the day, four or five times throughout the day, you know. You learn how to control it 
to be able to function and still be able to sell your drugs, you know. Now that you're older, do you ever think about those times? You know, I have never, I, I wouldn't even want to do cocaine. My heart would probably just <laughs> burst out like a cannonball, you know. But no, I have never had a craving once I gave my life to the Lord. And there again, I'm not here to preach, but I got to tell you, okay, when, 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 when I started to experience the true, the true power of God, it was a high that I never got off drugs. So maybe I'm still addicted, but just addicted to a different kind of drug. Yeah, I feel like you know. we all have like an addiction <clears throat> personality yeah. within us that just uh, people fuel it in different ways. Right, right. So as I said earlier, I'm the same guy I was when I was 20. You know, I'm just on a different drug. Now it's the Lord, you know. So were you ever with like a motorcycle club or anything like that growing yeah, up? Yeah, I've rode with motorcycle clubs since I was 15 years old. What attracted you to that? You know, there again, you know, I think it's uh, – if you're looking to category people, your motorcycle clubs would be known as hoods, you know. And and I believe they, they welcome people, you know, and, and uh, I believe that they don't look down on you if you're not very bright or you've done something stupid. You know, they accept you who you are. You know, the, the only thing that a motorcycle club wants is brotherhood. You know, brotherhood. They want good, honest people, you know. And I found out, you know, and I know a lot of the a lot of the world today that isn't in that culture. They they look at the motorcycle clubs from the top 10. They look at them being bad people and you don't want to talk to them. And they're the people that help you get out of a mess, you know. So and 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 I say this in almost every interview I do. My dad always said if he was broke down. He had rather a, a, a bunch of bikers stop to help him than one carload of gangbangers because <laughs> we know the gangbangers, what they want to do, you know. Was there a negative <clears throat> stigma around motorcycle clubs back then? We know what it is now, but. Yeah, I think I think there always been. There always been from the very beginning, you know. Why? Because, you know, I believe that most of the world, they want to feel that freedom. And I won't say world. Most people in the United States, they want to feel that freedom. They want to know what it's like to just be a badass for one day, you know. So everyone's curious of that lifestyle. I believe the government fears that lifestyle because they want to control us, you know. And we all know that's what they want from us. That's why they give out so much free money. That's why we have welfare for people that don't want to work. Come on, man. I mean, I, I, I always tell people I started mowing grass when I was seven years old, okay? And uh, people would say, you can't even start the lawnmower. I'd tell them, you start it. I won't shut it off till I'm done. You got kids nowadays that are 15, 16 years old. They don't know how to start a lawnmower, you know. But the life that I grew up in, we were taught how to work. We were taught how to work hard, you know. And there again, I, I, I believe that the people in the biker world, the people in the hoods, those are the people that will invite you in and show you the most love and loyalty. Do you feel like you represent the modern day or the old school type uh, biker? No, I'm definitely old school biker. Yeah, definitely old school. You know, I don't know what's going to happen here with Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson, I don't know what's going to happen to you. You know, you can send this to Harley because, I, I mean, they're, they're talking a new breed of biker. There is no new breed of bikers, okay? You're either a real biker or you're not, okay? Like I seen the other day, they somebody posted a picture that Harley did of somebody riding a new Harley down the street in a rainbow suit. Come on. Don't even go there. I mean, I mean, it's so stupid. You know, you're either a biker or you're not a biker. Don't don't be a wannabe or a weekend biker. You know, you're, you're either living in that world. But, you know, with the one percent clubs, I don't know what they're going to end up doing with Harley. Seriously. Because some of the newer Harleys, they're, they're making this electric Harley now. Oh, come on. I'm not getting on no electric bike, you know. But, uh, yeah, they got this uh, all this new stuff coming out in Harley. 
and they're wanting to change the biker world, stop it, okay? But I, I believe Harley's going to run theirself into the ground. I believe Indian has a very good chance of pulling theirself back up again to being the top. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Indian. Yeah, you know, Ecclesiastic yeah. says everything only lasts for a season. You remember when Kmart was the big store? Yeah. Now it's Walmart. Yeah. Who's coming next? Target? I don't know. But, you know, there's everything only lasts for a season. You, me, everything. And that's like what social media represents. Like you could be on top <coughs> one day and then, I'm you know, telling you, man. it's up and down yeah. until the next influencer comes out. Yeah. What yeah. do you think is the biggest change? I know you just listed some changes, but from old school bikers to present day. You know, I believe that we're wanting too much of the comfort, you know, like like for me, I'm I'm an old panhead guy. <clears throat> I have a bike shop in Pennsylvania. We do custom bike work and everything. And I have six old panheads. You know, I got a couple in the museum. We have a biker museum at the bike shop. If you're out our way, Central City, Pennsylvania, you got to stop in and check us out. But uh, I have a I have some old pan heads that are basket cases and everything. So I like the old bikes, you know. They're not comfortable. They're nothing like my new street glide, you know. But you get a feeling when you're on that bike you don't get when you're on a new one, you know. So I know the old guys out there, and I shouldn't say old guys. I just met a guy at church this weekend. He was 16 years old. He had a street glide. His, his parents owned a rental company, and his dad just bought him an old pan head. So here's a 16-year-old kid. He looks at me, and he says, I like my pan head better than the street glide. And I was like, all right, we got a young kid that's kind of old school, you know. That's incredible. Yeah. So <clears throat> what happened in your 20s that was like the defining moment that shifted your, your lifestyle completely? <clears throat> you know, it would have been in 1990. I was living in Orlando, Florida, or living in Apopka, Florida, but Orlando everyone heard of. <clears throat> I went out to a bar room one night with some friends, and we got into a nasty, nasty bar fight. I mean, it was bad. People got shot. People got stabbed. Uh, the worst bar fight I've ever seen. Worse than anything you'd see. You got to remember what we watch on TV is not true. Okay, it's it, but this was reality, and even the police would not come into the bar. They blocked off streets around the bar. They had a helicopter hovering over top the bar. <clears throat> they started arresting people as they were coming out that night in that bar room. I said, if I make it out of here, I'm done living this life. Now, that wasn't, you know, a lot of Christians, they say, oh, that's when he gave his life to the Lord. No, I didn't. OK, that's when I made up my mind. I'm done. OK, I don't have a problem with dying, but I have a problem with what I'm going to die for. I don't want to die because of a jealous husband or jealous boyfriend. I don't want to die because a drug deal going bad. I don't want to die because of a bar fight. I mean, the road I was living, I was going to die for some stupid reason. So when I got out that night and I went home, made it to my house, <clears throat> I went in the house. I told my wife at the time, she was a stripper. <clears throat> I told her, I said, we're moving. She started crying because she wanted out too. She was waiting to hear those words, we're moving. And we moved back to my hometown, Central City, Pennsylvania, from Florida, you know. And in the biker world, I just walked away. People that were my friends and uh, the club that I, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't wear their cut or nothing, but the, I rode with all these guys. I walked away from them. Like, I just disappeared. Many of them thought I was dead, you know. So I went to Pennsylvania, and two years later is when I walked into a church and said, here I am, God. So you were allowed to just walk away from those clubs? You know, at, the, at that time, I wasn't, I wasn't wearing a cut. I was associating with them. You know, I was like a hang around, you know. And, you, yeah, you can walk away from any club. Now, you don't want to walk away bad. You always want to walk away good, you know. And how do you walk away good? You just go in and talk to the national president and say, man, I'm, I'm done. You know, I can't do this no more. And, 
and you uh, uh, walk away good, you know. If you walk away bad, you might find yourself in trouble one evening, you know. Would you say that's the biggest difference between like a motorcycle club and an actual street gang <coughs> where they don't let you off as easily? You know, I don't know nothing about street gangs, okay? I don't know anything about them besides I think I think they're almost like cowardless, a lot of them, you know. They work with a with a gang, you know, a, a gang. It's never one-on-one, -on -one, you know. In the, in the biker world, you got to remember, there's a lot of us, we travel by ourselves. you know. Uh, I'll wear, in the, in the area where I live in Pennsylvania, the club that I ride with, there is no club brothers in my area. So in, I'll wear my, my cut, I'll wear who I am uptown shopping in Walmart, you know. And so I'm by myself. I'm not with a bunch of club brothers, you know, and I'm willing to stand up for the club I ride with, you know. So it's interesting what you're saying about your wife because the movie does depict that she already had, you know, wanted out of the life and you were refusing to No, kind what of do happened, <clears throat> my wife, the, 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 the movie didn't quite, it wasn't quite accurate. Mm -hmm. But when, when we moved to Pennsylvania, my wife was still a stripper. When we got to Pennsylvania, she started going to church with my mom. And then within just a month or so, she gave her life to the Lord. It was actually two years later. She was pestering me every week. Will you go to church? Will you go to church? Like I tell people, you know, in my area of Pennsylvania, we call that nagging. And when we have a woman that nags us every week, we shut them up. We just do what they want to do. They shut up. OK, so I said, OK, I'll go. And that's how I ended up back in church. You got to remember <clears throat> no one had to convince me that God was real, okay? Uh, no one had to convince me that God was real. I just needed to know that I needed him. That was all. Why did they set it up with you making it look like you were in a long prison sentence, coming out of prison? You and know, then... I was arrested five times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you Google Sam Childers or if you do a background check, you'll see there's two Sam Childers, one 64 and one 62. The 164 was a fake ID. <clears throat> and I can tell you this, and you can check it out, and you'll say, my God, the guy is telling the truth. I was going to have it expunged at one time. I was going to have it expunged, but my stepdad, after my dad died, my mom remarried, he said to me, well, you know, that story, no one's ever going to believe it, and if you get it expunged, no one will ever believe it. So it's still there. So if I go to buy a firearm, because I was never convicted of a felon, <clears throat> I was never convicted of a crime, but that old Sam Childers, the one that says I'm two years older, I would have never been able to buy a firearm. You he, know. He's convicted of a felony? No, you know what's one? so crazy? I sat in jail, everything, yeah. <clears throat> and my brother had his old pan head up for my bond. This is a true story. And the bail bondsman is in one of my books. And I even went and seen him. He called my brother up. They made a mistake. The bail bondsman did. So all these papers come in that said my charges was all dropped. So he calls my brother and he says, hey, you can come down and get your motorcycle. Uh, everything's dropped on your brother. Here, it wasn't dropped. They dropped two charges. I had like five felony charges against me. So anyways, my, my brother, he went right down for the motorcycle. And my brother and me still close to this day. And he said, Sam, I'm getting you out of here. Or you're going to end up dead or in prison. So we went back to Minnesota. We moved from Florida back to Minnesota. He didn't know where we was when he found out he made the mistake. It was actually three years later when I got arrested. And just to tell you how God works, I got to tell you this. They had one witness they could get a hold of. <clears throat> he was the bouncer. And the bouncer, I walked him to my car with a gun in his throat. And he walked me. That's what saved me that day of not getting shot. And then I busted him on the side of the head. He fell to the ground. Here, literally, three years later, the only witness they had on me had a stroke about two weeks before the court hearing when I was arrested. And I'll never forget that day the judge said, uh, Mr. Childers, do you believe in God? And I said, well, well, yeah, yeah, I believe in God. He said, well, you better thank him 
because I got to cancel this whole thing today because the only witness here is back there setting. He was in a wheelchair. And so I got saved because I would have went to jail a long time, man. And he couldn't testify. At no, all. He, he, he had a stroke. He was sitting there in a chair like this, you know, yeah. he couldn't talk or nothing. Do you think about how different your life would be now if you had felonies? <clears throat> well, I wouldn't be able to own the security company that I own, you know. So I, I do, I speak in high schools. I, I go around to rehabs. I do a lot of speaking. And I tell people how important it is to really watch your actions and what you do. Because I own one of the top 10 security companies in East Africa. I wouldn't own that if I had one felony. And people say, well, you're in Africa. I had to do a background check in everything in Africa. You know, you got to remember there's things that will follow you around the world, you know. Would I be able to do good things? Yeah, I could still be rescuing children, but I wouldn't be able to uh, be in a third world country carrying a firearm. Oh, so the fe- I know in some countries you can have a, a firearm as a felon. No, not in not in East Africa. In Africa, you can't. Okay. No, no, in East Africa, you can't. Okay. Yeah, you can't have a firearm if you're a felon. Oh, interesting. But anyways, I was arrested five times, sat in jail every time. The I was in probably a total six to eight weeks total in jail, but I was never convicted of a crime. I mean, God really blessed me, you know. Yeah. So after that happens and you go to the church and you guys move, yep. and you start to rebuild your life with the new beginnings with the construction company and real estate. Well, when I went back to Pennsylvania, <clears throat> like I said, I was always good at business. So I started a roofing company, roofing and painting. So for those two years, from the time we moved in 1990 to 1992, I was making big money, man. You know, I'd smoke a little weed, you know, and drink a little bit. But then finally, when I walked into the church and said, here I am, God, I started making big money. I mean, everything just changed, you know. You can't ever outgive God. So the more good I would try to do, God kept blessing me. So uh, the, the, finally, the night I gave my life to the Lord, the second night, I went back to a church and a, uh, a, uh, the preacher prophesied over me. He said I was going to Africa, and I'm thinking, I ain't going to Africa. I'm a white guy. Why would I go to Africa? That's stupid, you know. Now I have dual citizen, and my wife is black, you know. But I didn't think I'd ever go to Africa. And then he told me that I was going to be in a war. And I'm I, I, uh, thinking in my mind, I'm not going to get in another war. I'm already married, you know. So here all of that happened in 1998, I end up in Africa, you know, but I knew for years, I knew that preacher, what he said was true. There was even a time in my life, like 96, 97, I was trying to buy my way out. <clears throat> I was making big money. In 1997, I wrote out a check for $20,000 and gave it to a mission in Africa. And I was literally thinking, God, wouldn't you rather have my money? And he said, no, I want you. So when I went to Africa, my very first trip, I heard about a village that was raided. And, you know, I've always been the kind of person, you tell me something, and if I'm interested, I'm not going to believe you. I got to go see it. So I heard this village. It was early morning that these rebels raided this village. And I said to some some soldiers, I said, man, I got to go see this. And they said, Sam, you don't want to go. Well, I went and seen it. And when we got there, there was bodies everywhere, dead, you know. And they weren't just shot. Most of them were hacked up with machetes. So you're looking at pieces of body. You're looking at the ground that was clay and dirt now stained with blood. And uh, I mean, your, your, your mind, your thinking, it's just gone. You're almost in shock. And the one soldier said, we got to start looking for children hiding. And I can't even comprehend what's happening. You know, my mind is just, you know, wandering everywhere. And he said, Sam, we got to look for children. So I was walking on the outskirts of the bush, you know, like the woods. 
and I came across the body of a small child, may have been nine, eight, nine years old, but I couldn't even tell if it was a boy or a girl. The waist down was gone. They stepped on a mine. And I'll never forget, I stood over that body and I said, God, I'll do whatever it takes to help these people. And I didn't realize what I said till probably eight years later because I'm still there. And now it's more than two and a half decades. I'm still there. You know, and I think God has a purpose for all of us. You know, the Bible says we're all called, but few are chosen. And I think the big thing is he called us all to, to a purpose, but there's not very many that's willing to say, here I am. And uh, I know that day when I stood over that body, I meant what I said. I'll do whatever it takes to help these people. And now it's been thousands thousands of children saved. You know, there's a really good movie out, The Sound of Freedom. And I mean, that movie made millions of dollars worldwide. And I'm not putting it down because if one child is saved anywhere in the world, that's awesome. But that movie was only about two children. The work that we're doing in East Africa is not about two children. It's about thousands of children that's been saved and it's still going on after you saw that village what did you do did you just immediately move to africa or did you go home and no i i went home and nothing meant anything anymore you know this was before i was preaching and and i was really a nobody you know but i made big money i had a lot of properties a lot of houses i started selling everything and, I, and uh, three months later, I was back in Africa with a pocket full of money and went back home, you know, and I, I was ambushed in those times. You know, I've been ambushed <clears throat> over 10 times, been in over 10 major battles. They've tried to assassinate me over 10 times, you know. I mean, even being the machine gun preacher, even here in the U.S., like I live in the clubhouse on the back back of my bike shop when I'm here, you know, but you still have to take precautions. You can't even you can't even walk around my house outside and me not know it, you know. Because you have I mean I get death threats a lot, you know. US based or uh, No, I get death threats everywhere I go. Everywhere. Really? Yeah. Why yeah. do you think that is? You know, there's always some wacko out there that wants to make a name for himself. Look at the the movie The Sniper, you know. Mm-hmm. Awesome movie. That guy was an awesome man, fought for our country. Some wacko d- does a man, you know. I, you know, there's always wackos. We'll never get rid of wackos. It's like Jesus said in the Bible, the poor will always be with us. The wackos will always be with us, you know. So even though the life that I live doing good, you still got people that want to cause you harm. You know, my home in Africa is well guarded and, you know, that's why I have a security company too, you know. How did your first wife take the news of what you wanted to do when you got back? You know, my first wife, I can't really talk about her, man. She was a good woman, <clears throat> uh, faithful woman, godly woman, I, you know, good with money. I mean, I can't talk about her. But 17 years in, she just one day says, let's quit Africa. She wanted me to walk away, put a big sum of money in the bank, which was all legal, nothing illegal about it. Rock our grandbabies on the porch and, you know, take care of the little church we had from the movie. And she just wanted me to walk away and quit. I couldn't do it. You know, for me in my mind, you know, So I rescued children. 17 years later, the children made me famous. It it wasn't me that made myself famous. The children made me famous because they gave me a purpose. So now I'm going to walk away? You know, I don't think there was nothing wrong with it, but I couldn't handle it. You know, so I knew that I had to keep going for the rest of my life, you know, and, and I'm sure I'm going to die in Africa. You know, I'm, I'm, I have no plans of quitting, you know, uh, even, 
God forbid, if I'd get in a wheelchair or something, I was still going to do my days in Africa. What was the evolution of becoming, you know, machine gun preacher, saving the children? What was that first You know, what's, what's really crazy is a lot of people say, where'd the name come from? God gave me the name. And I'll never forget, this was before books. This was before movies, documentaries. Uh, God gave me this name, machine gun preacher. So I called my mom. And, you know, in the Christian world, God will give us a new name, some of us, you know. And I called my mom because my name was Samuel. I was named after Samuel in the Bible. So I called my mom and I said, Mom, God gave me a new name. And my mom's all excited. And she says, praise God, you know. And and she said, what is it? And I said, machine gun preacher. She said, no, 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 that's not a good name. But when God gave me the name, he told me it would be a marketing tool. So the name machine gun preacher, it's just a marketing tool. You know, if they put a sign up and it said Reverend Samuel Childers at the church this week, probably not too many people would show up, you know. It's not the same effect. But when they put the name Machine Gun Preacher will be here this week at such and such First Baptist Church, people drive by, they turn around to make sure they read it right. You know, machine gun preacher. And then when you Google, they find out, boy, this guy is the most controversial preacher in the world. So they don't really come to hear the message from Jesus. They come to hear the message from me, but then they end up hearing about him, you know. So that's how I got the name, you know. And I had the name long before the movie, long before any of the brand, you know. It's inter- Did you ever think that, you know, it would become <coughs> this brand when, when you were given that name? You know, I was the most likely never to succeed in life. And it, I remember years ago, I was in a church of about 3,000, and my mom never traveled much with me when I preached, but I loved her to be with me. And she was in the church, and I gave my testimony, and she come up to me after church and she said, Sam, you don't have to tell people all that stuff because my mom was a little bit ashamed. How could her son start using drugs at 11? How could her son become a addict putting a needle in his arm at 15? Because my mom was always a Christian. I think she come out of the womb born again, you know. And I always tell people she only sinned three times in her whole life when she gave birth to me and my two brothers. But so, but she she always was kind of ashamed of me to tell my testimony. But I told her, I said, mom, people got to realize that God is still alive and still in the miracle working business. You know, and there again, it, it, the average person out there, if you said, do you go to church? No, I I want to still have fun. Listen, man, if you're going to a church you're not having fun, then you need to find a church you fit in. Like our church, Three C's Church, my pastor was here with me the other week, okay? He's like all tattooed up, man. I mean, he has a good time. He's out there, you know, he does all kinds of sports and everything, you know? So the, the only thing, the only thing that we don't do is get high out of our mind, you know, but we, we might sit down and eat a pizza and drink a beer. And I don't drink a beer, but I might have a glass of scotch. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I do have a drink now and then, but I always tell people I only drink very, very expensive whiskey. And they say, why? And I said, that's the way I don't drink too much. <laughs> what was your mom's reaction when you said you were going and moving permanently to Africa? Uh, She was so happy. Yeah. Yeah. When I first started going, uh, I remember when I'd come back, because of stuff I've seen, you know, I've seen probably the most horrible things I don't even like to talk about, but I'd come back and I'd go down to her house for breakfast. And the thing I loved about my mom, when I sat at the table with her, I didn't have to tell no stories. She would just look at me, make me breakfast, and she'd just sit and watch me eat. 
And you didn't have to tell her no story because she knew. She knew what happened and, you know, what was going on. During the Coney War, it was it was pretty bad, you know. I've, uh, I've seen women with their breasts cut off. Uh, you know, when you watch the documentary, the new documentary, you'll see women with their noses cut off, their ears cut off. And 25 years later, we're interviewing these people. 20 years later, we're interviewing them. You know, people went through so much pain, and me, I lived through it, okay? But I'm not the one that got to look in the mirror every day, you know? You imagine being one of the ladies that had her nose cut off and her ears cut off. Every day, she has to look in the mirror. But I shouldn't say that because some of them that we interviewed said that was one thing they don't do. They never, never look in a mirror. The one lady that was interviewed said she don't even have a mirror in her little house that she lives in the bush. She says, I can't look at myself. You know, so, I mean, there's a lot of things up here that, you know, I wrote now my third book coming out in movies and documentaries and everything, but there's still stuff that you can't see. There's still stories I haven't told, you know. How did you come up with your first plan to save children <clears throat> when you went back there that, that second time You know, Africa? Joseph Coney was a coward. The LRA were cowards. They pried on children. They couldn't get men to fight their war. So they would, they would, uh, they would raid villages and steal children, and they would turn children into child soldiers by making them kill their parents or kill a relative. You know, a lot of people say, well, I don't see how a child 10 years old could kill their parent. You got to remember, <clears throat> your mom is sitting there and the rebels will whisper to her, if your child doesn't kill you, we're going to begin to cut your child up piece by piece in front of you. We'll start by skinning him alive. You know, if you guys ever come up to my office in Pennsylvania, I can show you pictures of people skun alive. And so the mother, you know, a mother loves her child so much, she'll beg her son, kill me. It's okay. And so the child will end up killing the parent because the parents don't want to see their child die. So the child, that's the beginning of being brainwashed because that child believes there's nothing worse they could ever do in their life besides killing their mom or dad. So that's how they begin to make a child soldier. And Joseph Coney, he, he, was, he was coward. Yeah, I mean, he, he, done, he needs to pay for everything that he's done, you know. The, the LRA, I've seen children that were raped so bad when they were three, four, five years old, their bottoms was hanging out, you know. Children nailed to trees. Uh, 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 ch uh, children and grown-ups scun alive, you know. Joseph Coney needs to pay for what he has done, and every LRA soldier needs to pay that was involved. Now, I believe when I was in middle school, or like early 2000s, this went viral, Coney. I remember yep. seeing posters mm -hmm. and, and all of that, too. Yep, absolutely. There was, there was a group of young people out of California that was really invisible children. You remember that was mm -hmm. the name of them. And I don't know if they're still out there or not. They run into a lot of problems. I think the thing that I tell a lot of people— we're, we're not the best nonprofit out there. We're not the best 501c3. I'm not trying to say we are. But what I will say to you, we're still there. 28 years is a long time to start something and never stop, and it keeps getting bigger. Uh, <clears throat> I, I know that my days are numbered, whether it's health or whether it's somebody to kill me. But I knew when I was 55, I didn't want to die or be on my deathbed and know everything I gave my life for is going to fall apart if I die. So at 55 years old, I started forming and working and 
making the organization that if I die, it's going to keep going on. And right now, the organization is fixed. It's set. If something happens to me, it still goes on. Uh, <clears throat> I used to have a lot of people say, well, Sam, where are you going to get buried at? You know, even if I would die in the U.S., I want to be buried in Africa. And so in Africa, I have a cemetery at my farm, you know. So I, I used to always tell my wife, I, I ended up remarrying in 2018, beautiful young African girl. She's 20 some years younger than me. Beautiful, man. I mean, hot, not beautiful, hot. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I'd always tell her I went buried at the farm. So we have a American style truck stop in Northern Uganda, uh, two restaurants, hotel, supermarket, uh, 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 auto parts or, or auto place, tire shop. We're, we're very big in the working people there. It works about 130 people. So every day people stop at this American style truck stop and they'll get out and they'll say to a guard or one of the workers, is a machine gun preacher around? And they'll say, uh, well, no, or sometimes I am, you know, and they get pictures with me and everything. So my wife says, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't bury you at the farm. And I said, well, okay, why? And she said, we bury you in back of the truck stop. So when people stop and they say, is machine gun preacher around? We can still tell them, yeah, he's out back, <laughs> you know, so... I'll probably get buried at the truck stop now, you know. That's incredible. And and for all the love you get out there, I'm sure there's, you know, uh, people <coughs> that despise you and are after you, which is why you need security too. You know, there's, you know, the biggest problem we have, and I really don't care. And if ISIS hear me saying their name, ISIS, you're a coward. I'm very easy to find. Google machine gun preacher, come see me. I got something for you. But, you know, ISIS can be a problem worldwide, you know, and uh, in the Congo right now, the ones that's giving a lot of problem is ISIS, Islamic uh, State, and uh, ADF of Congo. You, them three groups have come together, but they're coward. I mean, I, mean, I don't, I, listen, you're either going to fight for a cause or you're a coward, okay? And these, these rebel groups they're not fighting for a cause. How can you say you're fighting for a cause if you're killing an old lady? How can you say you're fighting for a cause if you're stealing children and raping children? That's not fighting for a cause, okay? Uh, what does ISIS want in Africa? What is their goal out there? You know, ISIS want the same thing. They want to rule the world, you know. They believe in their mind that they will rule the world one day. And, if you know, I don't want to start talking politics, but I will tell you, like, the war we have going on right now, you know, uh, Israel and uh, what's what's going, what's uh, uh, Habas or whatever this rebel group is, people are wanting to negotiate with them. You cannot negotiate with a terrorist. What's wrong with our, what's wrong with our world today? You know, we cannot negotiate with a terrorist, okay? It's like putting a Band-Aid on cancer. It's not going to go away. So when you start seeing these terrible things happening in these villages, how did you yourself go in and save it? Because you're very hands-on. It's not like you had people <laughs> You know what we've done in. one time? Mm -hmm. they, were, they, they were getting that they wouldn't want to ambush. They knew my truck. So they didn't want to ambush me anymore because they knew I was going to get out and fight. <clears throat> so we actually took a like an, a small food truck, you know, and I put the dresses on soldiers. <laughs> so they they did they just thought they were like women in the back of a truck, you know, and then as soon as the as soon as they would ambush us, they found out we were soldiers, you know. So so there was we done all kinds of things, you know. People say, oh, machine gun preacher was hunting Joseph Coney. No, I was never hunting Joseph Coney. Joseph Coney was hunting me. But what we done is we have been ambushed so many times. And, and I, all, I had it in my head. You know, I'm not saying I was right. And I'm not saying my head was right at the time. But I had it in my head. If I travel the road as many times as I can during the week, and every time they ambush me, we're going to win. You know, so we start to eliminate the problem. And so we traveled the road all the time, you know. 
We traveled the road hoping to get ambushed that we could fight, and we we would always win. So you would never provoke, but you would always be on the defense, which would and it technically be an they offense. Were, they were ambushing. The Lord Resistant Army, you get on the internet, you start Googling. <clears throat> you know, like the movie showed them having automobiles. They never had automobiles. You know, they were they were foot people. That's why they were so hard to 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 find and and hunt down. They lived in the bush. They would come out to the roadways, ambush, cause their terror, and then go back into the bush. You know. When did you first become on their radar that this that they needed to retaliate against you? My within the first year that I was in Africa. Yeah, within the first year. You know, my very first trip in, I was ambushed. My second trip, I was ambushed. My very first trip is when I seen the body of the small child that, that, uh, that like I said, you know, when we turn our life over to God, God has a plan for every one of us. The plan is not your plan. I mean, I had a plan. I, I was a, a high school dropout that could make money, you know, and I love to make money and uh, I love to have money. And then all of a sudden God had to plan for me. And the first eight years I was broke. <clears throat> One guy done an interview and he told a story about how when he first seen me, I had a pair of work boots on that had cardboard in the bottom to cover up the holes. And I had a pair of jeans on that was all ripped and they weren't designer jeans, you know. So the first eight years that I was there, it was rough, but I never stopped, you know. And even though when I first went, it was hard for me to go because I, I spent everything. Just like the movie showed, I started selling everything. I had a gun collection, but it didn't show. I had a camper trailer. I sold my camper trailer. I had uh, four-wheelers. I had motorcycles. Had a fishing boat, man. I sold everything I had just to rescue children. Now, when you say ambushed, is it, you know, like a bunch of soldiers coming after you or these rebels? No, usually and... what they would do, you know, there's no roads that like in the rainy season, <clears throat> it's like mud holes. So areas that areas that you would get stuck in, areas that were they knew you had to go slow or going to get stuck, they would have their soldiers in the bush next to the road and just start shooting. Like there was one time, Ding from the movie, Ding still works with me to this day. Mm -hmm. Ding is a soldier. He's still in the military, but he's, he's at the orphanage. I'm with Ding all the time. Ding was just with my wife and secretary all last week guarding them in South Sudan. So Ding is a real life soldier. <clears throat> Ding was in my passenger seat and I'm driving and one guy jumps up and shoots through the front window. It comes through the front window and out my side window. The bullet literally went in front of my face. And I'm driving with a pistol in my hand. And I literally just turned like that and right in front of Ding's face shot the, at the person. You know, I don't like to, I never talk about hurting people, but I shot at the person that was shooting at us right in front of Ding's face. And when I shot, Ding was like, ah, ah, ah. and we're driving down the road. And I said, Ding, you okay? And he said, don't do that again. <laughs> he said, I can't hear because <laughs> the gun went off. You know, you imagine taking a high powered pistol and shooting it right here in front of your face, you know, so it, it kind of, his ears were ringing, you know. What about kid <clears throat> soldiers? Do you encounter those at all? So many times, and I love to tell this, I have never had to lift a firearm to a child soldier. Would I? Absolutely. Every time I was ever in a presence of a child soldier, see, a child soldier, they're looking for a way out. That 10-year-old, that 12-year-old, that 14-year-old. Now, you get older than that, it could be different. But the, the child soldiers, they're looking for a way out. And they would just throw their guns down and hands in the air, you know, just like it showed in the movie Machine Gun Preacher. Yeah. And I tell you what, the new documentary, 
And yes, I'm pushing the new documentary. You can go to a website. You can download it. You can call the office. We can send it out to you. We, we have a, a professional company made flash drives, DVDs. They're all branded. Or you can download it. But, but I mean, it still shows <clears throat> this stuff still going on to this day. This ministry, now our ministry name in America is called Angels of East Africa. But Angels of East Africa is surrounded by the branding Machine Gun Preacher. You know, there's even a clothing line, Machine Gun Preacher. Yeah, we there's a clothing line. You can go on Machine Gun Preacher Facebook and you can see the clothing line. I mean, it it does probably eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars worth of clothing a year, you know. It's just all it is is branded clothing, you know. And all of that stuff goes back to the work I'm talking about. We drill wells, you know, in East Africa right now, <clears throat> 1,200 children die per day of diarrhea caused by bacteria and parasites from water. We drill an average of one well per month, deep well. That costs us between nine to 10,000 for a deep well every month that we drill. Some months we might not drill one and then the next month we drill two or three. Uh, we do the Bush Kids Project. We treat children, started out children only, malaria, bacteria infections, wounds of all different kinds. We started out just children only. Now it's anyone that gets in line. It started out one day a month. Now it's three days a month. The Bush Kids Project, uh, uh, most people don't realize children alone in East Africa, 1,400 die per day malaria. You know, so keep in mind that our organization, we're just not in a battlefield work and we're out there uh, where no one else wants to go. We go into the bush with doctors, nurses, blood lab, security, medicine, and we treat every day we go out <clears throat> between two and 300 people a day. We end up treating mainly children three days a month. That's almost a thousand people a month we're saving. That project's been going on, going on three years now. What does a typical day like <clears throat> look for you well, from the time you, you know, wake up over there to the end of the it day? It all depends where I go. A typical day is getting up, you know, doing your thing, you know, getting yourself ready and everything, doing your breakfast. But I arm myself. Same thing I do anywhere I go. You know, I'm like I said, you're, you're always armed, you know, so you arm yourself. Uh, depending where I'm at, I might be, if I'm at the farm, I might be on a tractor. You know, if, if I'm at the farm, I might be out looking at the crops, looking at the cows, you know. Might go out for a little hunt, you know. Might go down to the river where we're not far from the now. I might go down with a fishing pole, you know. Uh, if I'm in Kampala, I do most of the, when there's problems at nighttime with security company, I'm the first one to get up, jump in the truck and run out to the problem. Uh, at the truck stop, I'm right now I'm building a new building. <clears throat> I'm building a American style strip mall, nine more businesses, uh, some more hotel rooms, VIP rooms on top. And people say, why do you want to build all this business to make money? Not necessarily. Now, I do make money. Just this one building I'm building now, it will create 35 more full-time jobs. Right now, we're at about 130 at the truck stop. So that means this massive piece of property, 70-some acres, is going to have full-time workers because it's basically 24-7 working. <clears throat> we'll basically have 160-some workers Plus, there's a big conference room that I've dedicated it Sunday morning, 7 till 12, having church in a high-tech conference room, you know. So, so it, it all depends where I'm at. If I'm in South Sudan at the orphanage, I'm going to lay back and relax and have fun with the children. If I'm in Gulu at my orphanage or Kampala at the orphanage, I'm going to hang out with the children. You know, they're, they're always dancing and singing and you know, and they like to braid my mustache and braid my wannabe ponytail in the back, you know. 
So I, I, I enjoy everywhere I go, but I work everywhere I go as well. How does the government respond to you <clears throat> out there, and, and how has your relationship evolved with them? I have a very good relationship with the government. Uh, the president of Uganda, very good man, born again. You know, some people don't like him, just like some people don't like Trump. You know, I'm a Trump guy. Like Some guy was going to buy a motorcycle from, from me, and he Googled our shop, and he seen a big Trump sign in front of my bike shop. And he said, well, look, are you guys really for Trump? And the secretary said, yeah, yeah, the boss is. And he said, well, I'm not gonna buy the motorcycle. And like I said, we don't need your money, okay? I mean, I, I'm a Trump guy, you know, and, and the president of Uganda, Museveni, President Museveni is a good man. I seen what he done for that country over 20 years and <clears throat> He's getting old, so my worry is now who's going to come in next. But whoever he's going to support, I'm going to support because I know he's going to follow the same shoes that President Museveni has been wearing. And hopefully he'll run another term, but, we, you know, he always wins a landslide, you know. So the country of Uganda I call the land of milk and honey. I don't believe there's no reason for anyone to leave Uganda. If you have a little bit of money and you're business-minded, you can do well there. <clears throat> if you're a farmer, you can do well there because everything will grow there. So Uganda, the land of milk and honey. South Sudan, I'm there only because of the children. If you Google the top 10 most dangerous places in the world to travel right now, South Sudan is number four. Why? Why is it so dangerous? Because of the rebels and politics and everything. You know, the country was basically being attacked by President Bashir of northern Sudan. That's why there's a South Sudan and northern Sudan. Northern Sudan right now is in a lot of bad politics going on. You know, there's really no president President Bashir is out of office. He's been arrested, been charged with genocide. Big, long story. South Sudan has a lot of tribal issues going on right now. <clears throat> if they could get their self together, there's billions, billions of dollars poured in from the oil in South Sudan. But, you know, there's too much tribal stuff going on, too much bad politics going on right now. Like I said, <clears throat> the only reason we're there, children, I don't want to get in the middle of politics in South Sudan. Uganda, I love Uganda, love the, you know, the government there. They treat me very well, you know, and uh, uh, Congo, I definitely don't want to, I mean, we're involved there only because of children. You know, every, everywhere that we're involved, it's only because of children. Do they you know? give you military support at all? Yeah, uh, Uganda or South Sudan. They any, both, yeah, they yeah, both country. do. Yeah, but yeah, okay. both of them do, you know. Are you looked at as like an outlaw out there? No, not really. I'm probably looked at as an asset, <laughs> okay. you know, an asset. Everyone needs a machine gun preacher. <laughs> yeah, that is true. But, but I'm sure like, uh, how do you think the, 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 um, the, the violent groups are looking at you as? Like, I'm sure they have you I wanted hope. and they're offering a lot of money for you. Yeah, and well, you know, in the past, there was there was a reward on my head, but that was from President Bashir of northern Sudan. Mm -hmm. he, even, he even had a, like, arrest thing. They wanted me to be arrested anywhere that they could find me, but now he's arrested now, you know. So things change, you know. The Ecclesiastics, as I said earlier— you know, everything only lasts for a season, you know. So I believe that the bad rebels, I don't want to say they're scared of me. I hope they are. But they know they they could have a problem. Yeah, they could have a problem. Now, you were there during those um, early years of um, the, the different groups. Like, I know there's like Hotel Rwanda and all of those movies that are based on those I time come periods. in after Hotel Rwanda. Okay. But I was there during the time. I wasn't in the area of Blood Diamonds, but I was there during that time. But the Coney War, I was not just there in the Coney War. I was the man known for fighting in the Coney War. Anything you Google, like you said, 
You looked into uh, Google, uh, you know, there's a lot of different documentaries, other people's documentaries that have me in, uh, newspaper stories, stories that I didn't do that other journalists came in and did. I mean, I was there during the Coney War from 98. Have you inspired other 1% <clears throat> bikers to come out there with you at all? I've had other 1% bikers come out on mission trips and serve and and uh, 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 yeah, so there, there's been many in the past. I, I have a few guys from the club that I ride with, some of my brothers that want to come out, you know, just to visit, not to, you know, not to go in and shoot people or anything, just to come visit. You got to remember Uganda, like I call it the land of milk and honey, but they got wonderful game parks, man. There's a part of Uganda that, that you, you got to Google to see it, you know, Merchant Falls, you know, you Google Merchant Falls, you imagine being within 20 or 30 feet of an elephant or, or a lion, you know, you can go into the game park and I'm trying to get you to come. We'll go to Merchant Falls, you know, imagine going to Choby Lodge. You can Google Choby Lodge, beautiful lodge right on the Nile, man. You know, so there's a lot of beauty of Uganda that people don't see that you need to really see the beauty. How, how um, like, structured <clears throat> is it? Is it is it like a suburban area? Is it you, more country? What is the infrastructure? You no, know, when you go into the game park, it's very rural, very rural into the game parks. But if you're in Kampala, you know, they got shopping malls that you, if, if I took you to the shopping mall, which I won't, I'll let a driver take you because I don't like the city. But, I mean, my wife or driver will take you into the shopping malls. When you're walking through that mall, you're going to say, oh, my God, am I really in Africa? Because they're, they're better than the United States, you know. Mm -hmm. Kampala is amazing. Now, keep in mind, when I first went there, there wasn't even a shopping mall. There wasn't, there wasn't fine five-star, six-star hotels I got to give the president the credit. You know, he's really done good in that country. You won't believe Kampala. I, I'm telling you, there's six-star, seven-star hotels in Kampala, Uganda, man. And uh, beautiful restaurants. If you love Indian food, beautiful Indian food. There never used to be a Japanese or a Chinese restaurant. Google Kampala, Uganda. I think there's 13, 14... Japanese, Chinese, you know, Asian style restaurants there now. I didn't even know about any. There's of that, a yeah. Pizza Hut, you know, <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, well, McDonald's uh, are everywhere. I'm, I'm telling you, it, it's all there now. You know, every, Kentucky Fried Chicken is on every side of town there now. You know, but Uganda is really a country. I want to tell people, no matter what you have heard of Uganda 20 years ago. You need to visit Uganda. It's the land of milk and honey. That's interesting how it's evolved so much. Because in school, when I was growing up and then we were learning yeah. about this, this is not how it was. But there's still areas, <clears throat> there's still areas that need work. You know, they say that it takes 10 years before recovery really begins after a war. And then it takes another 10 years to do the recovery. So you're talking a country that was in war before it starts to stabilize. You're talking 20 years. So there is areas in the bush of Uganda that still needs help. You know, like where we do our Bush Kids Project, you know, if you look, the worst cases of malaria in East Africa is in northern Uganda. You know, so there's there's children dying. There's over 1,200 children dying today or dying a day from bad water, 1,400 dying malaria. So there's still a lot of work. But in some of these cities, the progress has really took hold. Is it less dangerous for you now than it was when you first got there? You know, when I first got there, I was constantly in the war, constantly every day. So I'm going to say it, it was years ago. But, you know, you don't really, you know, when you get my age, if it if life is not a little bit of danger, it's not very exciting anymore, you know. So, and I'm not saying you get used to it, but you kind of miss the adrenaline rush, you know. 
So I, I, I like the adrenaline rush a little bit. Have you ever talked to anyone from like the American uh, government, like FBI, CIA, or anything that you're doing out there? Many. And what do they think about all of this? Are they supportive? You need to watch my new documentary. Okay. <laughs> You'll see some on-scene footage where the federal government came after me and raided my motorcycle shop, raided my home. That was all in 2014, all in this documentary. In Pennsylvania? Or? Yeah, uh -huh. Pennsylvania. The federal government tried to shut me down at one time. That's why the documentary, that's one of the things. When you watch this new documentary, <clears throat> you're going to see 28 years of storms, 28 years of falling on your face, 28 years of blessings, 28 years of God's favor. But you're going to see 28 years where people tried to stop you or stop me, but I never stopped. That's why the title of the documentary is Never Stop. And even you as a young man, you run into difficulties you don't want to talk about. You run into difficulties that you might go to bed at night scared. You wake up in the morning and you're scared. But something keeps you going. And I believe when people watch this documentary, at the end, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about them leading their life with the attitude, never stop about the message. I mean, imagine this. 2013, I received the Mother Teresa Award, the largest award in the world for social justice. Six months later, the federal government comes after me trying to shut me down. Six months before, New York, Times Square, big building, my picture every hour is showing up for about two, three minutes my picture, the hillbilly from Pennsylvania, Times Square, telling everyone I received the Mother Teresa Award. Six months later, the federal government, armed with guns, watch the documentary, armed with guns, raiding my motorcycle shop. Imagine that. They literally, auditors said, we want to shut you down. The best thing you can do is shut your nonprofit down. I never stopped. So it was about the money. They're looking at the money aspect. Well, there was a lot of things. I, w I was accused for uh, 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 many different things, you know, for fraud, smuggling guns. I had a container ready to be shipped to Africa full of clothing and toys. It's all, you, you'll be shot. You got to watch the oh, documentary. I'm, I'm I didn't even but know I about mean, it. But I mean, everyone out there that's hearing what I'm talking about now, just to see what you're going to see is worth the 19 bucks, whatever it is, to buy the documentary. Because it's unbelievable. And it's unseen footage. No one ever seen it. Feds didn't even know I had it. Do you think you're targeted more or less because of that biker persona? Like if a, if a normal <coughs> like finance guy was running this operation, right, yeah. without the machine gun part and, and all of that, would he be targeted like you are? You know, I don't really know, but I know they don't like me to say this, but at one time— I was the only person to ever receive the Mother Teresa Award that wasn't a millionaire. They don't like me to say that. But money can buy you about anything you want. Money's got a lot of power. In I'm telling you, you know, for me, it was just about doing good. You know, it wasn't that I wanted to do it. It was God called me to do it. And then when I started doing it, it was the faces of those children that we've rescued. And I think it's the faces of the children I've rescued that keeps me going. And there's a few faces that I couldn't rescue that definitely keeps me going. Do you think about more of the ones that you don't rescue than the ones that you do? I try not to focus on what I've done. You know, to be honest with you, I talk about it because it gets people like you and other people interested to help me and do something. But I try not to focus on what I've done, and I try to focus on what I need to do. Because Americans, and I'm American, so I can talk about Americans. When we focus on what we're doing and what we have done, we get lazy. So I don't want to focus on accomplishments, you know, because I feel when we focus on accomplishments— and getting people, look what I've done, then we start thinking it's finished, you know. 
Why do you keep roots in America? <clears throat> You know, my, my brothers I have here, I have, I have a daughter here, I have grandchildren here, I have uh, four granddaughters and my daughter, uh, my brothers and me are really close. Uh, uh, yeah. What does your family think about what you do? Oh, <laughs> yeah. My, my oldest brother, his health isn't real good, but... You know, I'm like uh, I'm like his hero. My my brother George and me. He's in the documentary. We've always been really close, you know. But we 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 stayed very close. You know, it's hard seeing each other get old. But we keep going. My brother George works with me every day. He he's like I tell everyone. I don't want to say he works at the bike shop. He's my eyes at the bike shop. You know. So he's there every day, you know, and makes all the decisions. He has power of attorney over me. And he signs checks, and if you know, if I'm buying something, he buys it for me. You know, we're we don't argue. Me and my brothers don't argue. When we when we seen our mom getting getting old, she ended up getting Alzheimer's. We sat together and we made a decision that we would not argue over nothing. We made a decision if one brother didn't like something, the decision would be no, we won't do it. So we don't argue. Yeah, we, we, we kept a good relationship. Uh, maybe when we were younger, we argued and fought a lot, you know, but now that we're getting old, we don't argue. What do you think is America's or the world's biggest misconception about you and what you do? You know, I think... Uh, I think in the Christian world, a lot of people is turned off by the gun. But you, you got to remember, uh, there's never been a war ever won without a weapon. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, Jesus was not about weapons. Well, I'm not the one that said what Jesus did. Jesus told his disciples before he was crucified, go out and preach the gospel. Don't take a money bag. Don't take an extra coat. Go. Okay. After he was crucified, God raised him from the dead. He told his disciples again, now go preach the gospel. Take a money bag with you. Take a coat with you. And if you don't have a sword, buy one. I didn't say that. That's in the Bible. Okay. I know a lot of people's going to be going to be texting you and stuff on what I'm saying, but it's there. What did he mean by it? It wasn't to butter toast. What was he saying? Scholars will tell you. He was telling the disciples, there may come a time that you're going to have to defend yourself. Uh, when he said that you're worse than an infidel if you don't take care of your family, what did he mean by that? especially when he said, who is my family? And he made it clear, anyone that believes in me is my family. You know, so Jesus was not a wimp. Jesus was somebody that took the cross for you and for me and everybody out there. He was not a wimp. <clears throat> he could have destroyed everybody, but he didn't. He took the cross for us. You know, so uh, I, I believe that as Christians— some people think we're to be wimps. That's not true. Uh, every top 10 motorcycle club out there, there's a lot of born-again Christians, and a lot of them are badasses, okay? So being a Christian does not make you a wimp, for sure. What do you think, out of all of your years, out of everything you've been through, is the biggest lesson you've taken away from it that you want to share to others? I think the biggest thing is you can be whoever you want to be. If you want to go all through life and be a thug, you can be a thug. If you want to be go go through life being known that you was a thug, that you was the scum of the earth, and showing the world that you can change, especially with the help of God. And that's what I write in my books. You know, some people will say, oh, that machine gun preacher, all he wants to do is brag about what he's done. I'm bragging about what God done in my life, not me. I couldn't have done it, man. You know, I couldn't have done it. I do business conferences around the world. 
I won't even tell you what you got to pay to get me in a business conference. But my my booking agent is Kevin Evans out of Australia, and he he starts at ten thousand and plane tickets to get me in a business conference. You know, so how can that happen? I'm not educated. I don't have a college degree. I don't even have a high school degree. Now I would be I would be pretty stupid if I sat here and said I read a lot of books because I couldn't read or write at 14 years old. But I can tell you, I never went back to school. I just started serving someone that knew how to mold me and make me to who I needed to be. So yeah, I do business conferences. I, 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 I talk to people how to make money. I do it all the time. I do probably three or four business conferences a year. Yeah. yeah. I mean, experience is the greatest yeah. asset, you know, and the greatest but, teacher. But, you know, when it comes to business, what I always ask people is, why do you want to be in business? Uh, what do you want to accomplish and for who? And if you answer one of those three questions wrong, I'm going to tell you, just work for someone. <laughs> and and business doesn't necessarily have to be building like a franchise like this this conversation this is my business but Absolutely, it's not man. I'm not ever going to be one of those corporate type but, people but see the big thing is you got a heart for helping people and see when when I look at someone like you the bigger you get the more help you're going to do for people, you know. So it's purpose that's, driven. Right. That's yeah. what it's all about, man. You know, they, they had something a number of years, Pay Forward, I think it was called. I you watched know? that movie in high school. I'm, I'm <laughs> telling you, man, that's what it's all about, Pay yeah. Forward, you pay know. Pay Forward, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, that's what my third book is all about, helping someone. Yeah. You know, the guy that helped me was Clyde Carter, Jimmy Carter's third cousin. He oh. was the guy that gave me the opportunity in business. I remember when I came to his house, uh, <clears throat> he seen me on a roof or I was putting a roof on for him. And when I, when I got, or that morning, he said, I'll be by tomorrow to pay you. And I was really mean and looked ba mean and biker, you know, and, and I, I cussed at him and I said, you better be by here today to pay me. I want to pay today. And he said, you won't be done today. And I said, I'll be done. And I cussed at him again. And he come by late that afternoon. I was sitting on the ground on some shingles that we didn't use. And uh, he said, I didn't think you'd be done. And I cussed at him again. And I said, just pay me my blank, blank money. And he paid me and uh, he started to walk away and he turns around and he hands me a business card. He said, if you want to change your life, call me one day. About a week later, everything was falling apart, you know, drug addiction and partying and just my whole life falling apart. And I had that card on my mirror of, of my dresser and I pulled that card off and I called him from a pay phone. There was no phone back then, you know, no cell phones. So I called him and uh, he gave me an address. So I went to his house and he opened up the door. He handed me a $20 bill. He said, if you want to change your life, go down the road, get a haircut and come back. I snatched that money out of his hand and I went walking away cussing who does he think he is. And I drove down the road. There was a bar not far from his place that I was, it was like in a strip mall. I drank there before and I figured, well, he's going to give me a buzz, $20 buzz today. And when I was walking up to that bar, there was a barber shop in that strip mall. And I'll never forget something said to me, and I knew it was God because I wasn't going to church back then. Something said to me, remember, you called him. He didn't call you. So I walked into that place and got my hair cut. They trimmed my beard up. And I went back to his house, old Clyde Carter. And when he opened up the door, the first thing he said was, he was on crutches, Clyde was. He had his legs crushed. And the first thing he said to me was, what took you so long? He was the man that started changing my life. And my third book that's going to be coming out, that's what it's all about. Are you using your life to give someone else an opportunity in theirs? Do you think that no matter what path you chose in your childhood, you were going to be destined to be where you're at now? <clears throat> you know, yes, you know, I do because 
how I believe, I believe that God's the one that will open doors for us. When God opens a door for you and you stand in the threshold of that doorway, the decision you make at that moment will determine your destination in life. And I preach that almost every day, man. I don't think there's a day go by that I don't say that to someone. You might have to go through 10 doorways to get to where you're going, but there's always a door going to open. You know, here I am at 62 years old. I still have opportunities happening in life. Another door is going to open. So I always tell people, don't be too fast. Don't be too quick. Think about it. You know, unless you're rescuing somebody out of a burning house, you got time to think about it for a moment. 62 is still young. I mean, my dad's turning 80 soon, you know, and he's still working every day, 5 a.m., hustling. I'm telling you, you, man. You got a lot more to live. He probably didn't harm his body like (laughs) I did. (laughs) Yeah, true. But for me, I'm not, I mean, if God lets me live to 82 and still work, praise God. Uh, if, If I leave out of here today, praise God, you know. I lived a good life, and uh, I'd done things that no one else has ever done, you know. But I think he'll keep me around a few more years. Incredible. Well, Sam, thank you so much for coming here and and sharing your awesome story, and we'll have the links to your documentary and the books in the description of this. You know, what I can say to anyone, really look in. Go to YouTube. Go all over. Look in to the machine gun preacher Sam Childers. But right now in life, I need your help with this documentary. You know, I said earlier, everyone has made money off the Machine Gun Preacher. The movie, Machine Gun Preacher, never paid me. Owe me over 800,000. My first book, number one seller, made millions. I got it 250,000. My first documentary, more than 600,000 downloads and sales. I got about 100,000 out of it. I need listeners out there. Go to the MGP or www.mgp, never stop. Download the documentary today. Call the office, buy the documentary. The money is not going to me. It's going to a 501c3 Angels of East Africa that is focused on another 20 30 years of saving children.